Welcome to the Software People Stories. I'm Shiv. I'm Chitra. And I'm Gayatri. We bring you interesting untold stories of people associated with the creation or consumption of software-based solutions. You'll hear stories of what worked and sometimes what didn't. You will also hear very personal experiences and insights that would trigger your thoughts and inspire you to do even greater things. This is a repeat episode of one of my conversations first published in 2019. Since then we've crossed 200 episodes and the listenership has also grown. Some of you have been asking how you can know more about some of the topics covered in the recent episodes. I felt that there could be related points shared by other guests in earlier episodes but for new subscribers it may not be easily discoverable. So we thought that we would bring you select past episodes from time to time to help you discover more people and their stories also over time the formats of the intro and the show notes have also changed and this also gives me an opportunity to update the show notes to be a little more detailed this conversation with dorai todla will be published in two parts to keep the episode length to around 30 minutes in this first part dorai shares his serial entrepreneurship journey and also his definition of a micro product and how one can build very small things and still be very successful he talks about how he identifies problems to solve by soaking in the problem space his experience of concepts associated with a lean startup to validate ideas quickly and how he has put that into practice also a very interesting story that he shares about one of his products that has been innovatively repurposed by users to create vertical applications to make their own work easier beyond what the product was originally intended to do and how he builds in quality in horizontal products that may be used by various personas of users listen on dorai todla known as dorai to most has been in the it industry pretty much even before it became an industry that we know it as today combining his vast experience and his keen interest in spotting micro problems to solve he has been a serial entrepreneur and a mentor for many students as well as aspiring and successful entrepreneurs he likes to call himself a technopreneur working with product companies and startups join me in this conversation with dorai hi dorai thanks for being a guest on this podcast we've known each other for a long time but for the benefit of our audience I thought it is best if you can quickly introduce yourself. Okay, I think it's a uh, pretty simple. Uh, hi uh, everyone, I'm Dorai Dorai Thodla, but uh, you know everybody calls me Dorai. I'm basically a technology entrepreneur, been doing it since end of 1980. I started my first company at the time. I did two in India and uh, two in the US. Uh, the uh, the fourth company which is which started as imorf and now it is technology strategies is a small company that builds products. All my companies have been essentially either consulting companies in the software technology space or product companies and uh, they of course are inseparable in some sense. When you start building products you also need to provide consulting and then when you start doing consulting work people ask you to come and build some products for them and so we've been doing that so that's about most of what i can talk about currently i'm engaged in a couple of things since i have uh, you know the product company is like just a couple of us i always wanted to keep them small i also spend a lot of time running innovation programs in a couple of colleges where we take ideas from students and encourage them to build something that uh, they can showcase and help them contain the scope and uh, actually build a product and so these some of them are hardware uh, products and electronics products and some of them are software the other thing i do is uh, because i've gone through different styles of companies i have i try to help startups uh, especially in the early stage where they have an idea and they want to validate the idea and they want to build a prototype and get some feedback so i act as a mentor through several organizations including tai chennai and nascom and uh, you know various startup um, groups in india and finally uh, i like to build communities and so we build um, develop small developer communities and one of the latest ones i'm involved in is something called build to learn i notice that lots of students learn a lot of things in 
colleges, but they never actually build anything. So we meet once or twice a month, spend four hours. People come there with no knowledge of what to do. And we, uh, you know, attach them to somebody who's interested in building something. And they slowly start learning um, by actually doing things. And that we have done, I think, more than a dozen. I think the last count is about 14 or 15 sessions of this. And um, it's very beneficial to the first timers. It's also very beneficial to a lot of people who want to mentor students. So it's it's a great community. It goes between 20 people to 80 people, depending on the time. And that's um, pretty excited about, you know, taking that and spreading it around. Other than this, I just track technology. That's uh, my passion. And uh, that's what I do most of my spare time. Wow, that's a lot. I have, in fact, a few questions that I'll come to later, <laughs> including how do you find time to do all this? But um, you always say that now you are a micro product innovator. So what is a micro product? So uh, actually, there is a, it's a very loose definition. I don't think it's, there is an industry term called micro product, but there is this notion in the software industry uh, or in the startup in the, in the startup ecosystem that you need to build big things to be successful and um, uh, to be very frank you can build uh, very small things and still be reasonably successful Uh, of course your definition of success may vary from mine my inspiration comes from a company like it's called uh, Norton Computing and Peter Norton and five others. And at one at the time, I knew them kind of reasonably well. There were six people and generating $17 million in revenue. And uh, there are no marketing, no sales, nothing. And each one of the members uh, generated, you know, a couple of million dollars. Uh, they you wrote books, but they built amazing products like the, um, everybody may know about uh, Norton antivirus, but before that, they build the first disk defragmenter and uh, think about the technology that needs to go into building something like that and a whole bunch of uh, Norton utilities are very famous so they built these little products and they uh, wrote about them and sometimes it is books sometimes it's articles and uh, and it's a small group doing very high quality work and I think there is a chance for lots and lots of companies to participate in this style of product economy and um, so the best way to express that in a single term is micro products is that micro products is anything that a person can build in three months time or one or two people can build in three months time, launch it, get people to use it and even pay for it. Uh, and when you do that, um, and if the product is really good, uh, lots of people will use it, in which case the direction of the product will be completely controlled by users. And that is what we really want. The product is not very good you fail really fast because you're not spent more than three to six person months. And so I think it's a great way to enter the product ecosystem. And then micro product is a starting point. If you want to take one product and become a really big company, nothing stops you from doing that. Um, but um, if you want to produce a series of products, and this is ideal for solopreneurs, solopreneurs are, you know, a single person entrepreneurs um, who are highly productive and uh, really like doing fun stuff and uh, creating things of value. Yeah, wonderful. In fact, uh, nowadays, you know, people do talk about you know, being a startup is very fashionable and also all this lean startup, fail early, fail fast and all that. Uh, I think all that you know, you've been through. But then how do you identify a problem to solve? Okay, so I'll my experience has been since 82 until now right so i'll go back to lots of stories in the initial stages because you know that i think probably will give you a lot more relevance we started before internet even started even pcs were not there that much when we started so uh, in 83 sometime in 83 84 i was consulting for a company that was selling computers and they wanted a tool to uh, you know uh, run benchmarks because at that time in india Every company would run a COBOL benchmark before they bought a computer because they're actually buying 80, 86 computers, but almost treated them like, you know, like mainframes. So what we would do is uh, the company that wants to benchmark would give them a COBOL program at the time, and they had to run it on uh, three of their competitors or four of their competitors, and they had to run it on their own and then show them some compile times and, you know, run times and show that, they're, you know, they're one of the top performers, if not the top 
maybe in the top two or something like that. And then they would negotiate the price. And uh, one of these companies I was consulting for came to me and said, Jaray, this is like, we're spending a lot of time and we're not able to get that many COBOL programmers. And sometimes it becomes, you know, like really uh, the differences are very small between these compilers. What can we do? And, you know, that was, I think, one of the early product ideas. And I said, hey, why don't we write a simple converter that uh, takes program in one format and converts it to program in other formats and which was a very simple text-based, you know, replacement. Just the syntax was slightly different in uh, minor differences because COBOL is a fairly standard language. And uh, when I was looking at it and I said, hey, why can't we write this in COBOL itself? And, you know, I think that was one of the first products. And I didn't know whether you can turn it into a product, but this they were using it and they saved lots of time lots of money because instead of people sitting there compiling, doing testing and all that sort of stuff and they're able to use it. And then we improved it over a period of time, a couple of iterations. And uh, so this is actually a problem and a solution turned into a product that can be distributed to anybody to use it. And, you know, they could, they could do this kind of thing. And that's when I started getting some ideas and saying, hey, maybe there are these little products that you can do and you can, you can help out in you know, people the other one, which I think I'm pretty proud of and keep talking about it in every forum I can get, was there was this company uh, that had a COBOL compiler that was very slow and they were losing a lot of benchmarks. But they, otherwise, other than the COBOL compiler, almost everything else on that machine was really fabulous. A good product, you know, very solid, you know, based on technology from US. So I took a look at it and they said, hey, you know, can you make the compiler faster? And I said, Oh, I'm not a compiler guy. Uh, how can I make it faster? And then there's the there are a couple of other constraints. We had no sources of the code, and open source was not very popular at that time. Or if it was popular, we didn't know about it in India. So um, we thought through the problem, found a couple of reasons why the compiler was slow, and then went and built some technology that made it run like ten times faster. The compiler was. All the trick was very simple and compiler was used to write a lot of files uh, while it was doing the compilation because the, it had memory constraints. And uh, all we did was, was we created a memory disk that the compiler thought it was writing to disk and it was actually writing into memory. So it became very fast. And, you know, at that time, I didn't know that you could actually take products like this and sell them uh, internationally. So we did it more like a, a on, on request, but it was heavily used. And then the company got back into the business of competing on, on compilation speeds and uh, and things like that. You know, like you get into early validation. It's a very clear metric on whether it's useful or not. And uh, it is a bounded problem is that, you know, in the, in the end, you know whether compiler ran faster or not. And you run it without this accelerator and with the accelerator to see the difference. And there's no ambiguity about its uh, usefulness. Yeah, going back to your question, I think the only way you can get realistic product ideas is to soak in the problem space. You pick a problem space and you, you know, you spend a lot of time, you look at things that are blocking people from moving forward and out of that comes idea. And if you know technology enough, you can always find a technology solution to a product. Yeah, that's uh, actually very nice. So have there been instances when uh, you know, something that you developed and the actual use case was different that it surprised you? Because I had heard, uh, for instance, in a different industry that uh, you know, a washing machine maker suddenly found that you know, there were a lot of machines being sold in Punjab. And when they wanted to find out, they were actually using it to make lassi. So something like that, what was not originally intended, but then you, know, you found it you know, kind of amusing or surprising. Yeah, I, I think that tend to happen with certain products much more than other products. In this particular Lassi case, I've heard the story also, and it's hilarious. Um, you know, so, but that was clever innovation by the users of the product. And uh, they said, hey, we, we need to mix a large amount of liquids, and this is how we're going to do it. And uh, it, it, they turned a washing machine into a, you know, a mass uh, milkshake kind of stuff, in which is Lassi is basically uh, yogurt and plus some fruit or something like that. Or, yeah. But uh, it, it, the more vertical the product is, the less chances of it's being un, used in different contexts. But most of the products we build are horizontal products. Like, for example, uh, uh, there's a product that we've been shipping since 2002. It's called InfoMinder. It was, it, 
it is born with a very simple idea and i'll talk more about it later but essentially it tracks web pages and sends you alerts and notifications and i built it because i was tracking about 300 pages on the web and i said hey you know i can't go and spend a minute on each one of them every day so i wrote this tracker first it was a perl script written by one of my uh, friends and then later turned it into a full product and then we gave it away to a bunch of people and then saw people using it and then turned it into a product and you can't believe it if i tell you but 16 years later uh, it's still being used people are still paying for it and we have zero marketing sales and uh, it's one of the few it doesn't generate large amounts of money but it generates a steady stream of revenue that product wow. surprised me because i i built it to track bookmarks you know when you bookmark large amount of pages and you want to see what changes and then you can get alerts and i look at the alerts every day and you know that's what we built it for but i found that once we gave it to people it was used for wide variety of applications you know i things that i never even thought about one company was using it to track um, movement of uh, senior professionals on websites by looking at the team and then you know use it for recruiting purposes like you know people who left or people or uh, if there is a vp who left they would track the vp down you know vice president and then you know try to find him another job or something like that this is before the days of linkedin right now i think it's much easier to go to linkedin and do some of these things but the strangest case was i got a call from a guy and um, this guy said hey you know um, can this i am i'm interested in using this product but i want to know whether you can send me alerts like three four times a day and we had restricted it to just sending alert once a day because we don't want to keep on going and you know looking at a website and because it will get blocked and i said yeah but tell me why you want to do it this guy is somewhere in the bay area he is a guy who fixes who does roof inspections uh, in the us um, like in many other places uh, if you want to sell your house you need to get a roof inspection done and you get need to get a certificate and there are certain people qualified to do that and the way they get the business is they just go and see which houses are on sale and then do that and this particular person had a competitor whose wife was going to the internet and looking at this mls listings and uh, what is called multiple listing service where houses are listed and uh, sending him uh, messages or call you would call after he fixes one you know, inspects one roof he'll uh, call home and his wife say oh why don't you go to this other place where they are wanted and so these guys used to do that and and the person who approached me obviously had nobody at home who can do it for him and you know at that time internet was not that easy in mobile smart mobile devices didn't even exist kind of thing and so he said hey you know can i use your product for just tracking this website where they list all the houses ready for inspection and it's you know it's a use that i i think i would never have thought of when when i started building the product and this is not just one there are like dozens of stories like this and there is pleasantly surprised that how different a product can be used for yeah amazing i think never underestimate the ingenuity of users right yeah, that's true yeah so actually that brings me to uh, an, another related point you know, which has been um, also one of my favorite things about how do you build you know, whether you call it uh, the mistake proofing in the products when you build something like this and you don't know the users or users are either too uh, experts or specialized or anybody can use it particularly for horizontal products how do you make sure that whatever you build the quality is good see i think i mean there has to be some minimum quality without which you can't put a product out to beta and that comes out of experience and um, you know the first few products we built we didn't have a unit testing framework or black box testing or something and we'll just give it to a bunch of users and they'll find out so the products that you know the like like informator that i'm talking about essentially what we did was we uh, we give it to a bunch of users and we have a beta period look at what google did with gmail you know they were in beta for a few years right you just keep giving it to people and then let them use it and they will tell you uh, because you can actually uh, go and thoroughly test it and then you know take a long time to get into the market but the biggest risk in a product is not the little bugs that are going to stop you from doing something it is the basic usefulness of the product and so there is this dilemma that most of the startups and product startups go through is that 
hey, you know, even if I give it away free and even if it works perfectly, will anybody ever use it? And uh, so the best way to find that out is to offer it to people. And the moment you start offering it to people, you hit a whole bunch of problems that cause nothing to do with product. First of all, how does the world know that your product exists? You know, today we have uh, things like product hunt and, you know, other similar sites. But your first problem is, hey, I have this great product. I think it's pretty cool because I've been using it for X number of time. And a few of my friends have been using it and we all find it useful. But how do I convey this to the rest of the world? And and I'm not a marketing person, right? Um, so uh, it used to be very difficult before. Um, it used to be expensive. Uh, but once the internet came about and it's become a little easier, uh, but not a whole lot easier because there are, you know, millions of these products around the world. How does somebody discover the product. So I think I'll fix that problem first is that proving the usefulness of the product. And then if it is really useful, people will start telling you, uh, you know, that, oh, there is this problem and or how do I do this? And sometimes they may not even know that you have this functionality. They'll say, hey, can we do this with this product? And, you know, you tell them, oh, that's a feature. You just go there and, you know, click on these two menu items and go to the third page. And there is this little thing that you can do. Um, so lots of times, even the feature discovery is, you know, because you don't necessarily write good documentation, not people ever read documentation. So, you know, that is one thing. Second thing is that uh, there has to be a basic quality. That is the product should not crash. The product should, when you put it out, should function as people expect. And that is a tall order because you don't know what people expect. So one of the reasons why a lot of people say that, hey, you build something to scratch your own itch, uh, you fix that problem by using it and you expect X out of this product and you're going to find similar users. You know, that is why, um, you know, uh, you take care of, sorry, that's how you basically take care of, uh, you know, this mystery about, hey, is it useful? Is it usable? All those kinds of things. Because if you're constantly going to use it, you know, in American terms, that it's called dog fooding your product. And it's it's easy when you build products that you can use. It's much more difficult if you are building a ERP system for a company, uh, an enterprise, and you are um, not one of the users of that system. How do you know how people are going to use it, and how what are they doing currently? And so you have a different set of challenges. With micro products, you don't have, right? You either build it um, because you needed it or you know how to use it and you can map yourself to the, you know, same problems that the users have. And, um, and that is the best way to go about it. Uh, some, sometimes it may not be possible, in which case what you do is you get, that's why you get a user group to test it. So one of the early identification um, things that you need to do is to find users who are typical users. So if your product has more than one type of users, find uh, groups of users, but pick one major benefit this product provides to users and then get the users to realize that benefit and then help them realize that benefit and see how difficult it is to for them to realize it. And if it's very difficult, you already know there is something wrong with the product is that, you know. Um, so I, I that is the approach I would take. Uh, the uh, when you say beta or alpha, previously you know when we had no internet, none of these kinds of things were there. You know, even companies like large companies like Microsoft would release several beta versions or alpha version. Then you know, alpha version is just barely features. You should not you know may not have may have bugs, um, but no showstoppers. And then beta version is almost complete but not shippable yet or you can't charge them for it kind of stuff and then but today the problem is a lot less because um, because of cloud and SaaS, you know like a, you know software as a service you can incrementally roll out features you can so start with the minimum core that is really useful and then slowly start adding features and then the, you can instrument it in such a way that there are techniques today where certain new features are available only to a certain class of users Facebook does this all the time and uh, most of the cloud-based products do this all the time and you'll suddenly see a feature in Twitter or Facebook that's available only to a small group of users and you know so there is an engineering um, uh, solutions to this kind of problem yeah nice so the related thing is um, I know you 
also have been working a lot with students, you said. Yeah. Right. And um, related to that, when you uh, mentioned this, you know, build to learn, right? Yeah. Uh, which is also probably, you know, twisting the whole thing, which is uh, against the normal thing, saying you go somewhere, you learn to build or you learn to do something. Yeah. And then you also, uh, now I know you, you talk about you know, uh, thinking about thinking or you know, learning to learn, you know, those kinds of things. So when you kind of abstract or uh, you know, take some of these things to a higher level, uh, how does that help you? you know, is this something that uh, others can also use? The answer to this question and more stories from Dorai, do not miss the next episode. We thank Siddharth for the music and Anita for promoting the software people's stories. If you like this episode, please subscribe on your favorite podcast client and spread the word in your network. If you'd like to share your story, contact us at podcast at pm-powerconsulting.com.